Hey, Coach, thanks for joining me on this Simple Coach Coach interview. do appreciate you taking the time today. Um, before we, we begin, I'll, I have to say, like, I've, I've, um, I've been wondering a lot whether Simple Coach has made the, you know, the history books as the, you know, as a world famous YouTube influencer. I'm always looking for metrics. So, um, you know, I look today, I have, you know, over a thousand subscribers. Really cool. Um, but the real, you know, it's like, how do I expand my footprint? And it dawned on me today that I have to expand my, my footprint in by first hiring an executive assistant because I can't keep my calendar straight. And um, I, I, you know, I, like I mentioned earlier, I had it for, we were going to talk at noon and it turns out I said 10 and got all confused. So I apologize for that. But thank you for making me come to the realization that this simple coach um, brand is set for global expansion at an unprecedented level. Um, hey, so I gotta, you've been, you've been, let's just jump right into it. You've been the head coach at SUNY Delhi. Delhi? Did you just say De it like Delhi? Yeah. Okay. Delhi. 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 Okay. Okay. I was like, Delhi, isn't that India? Delhi. Okay. Um, since June of 2021, uh, we'll, we'll talk about sort of your experience at the, at, at the school, but what's, what's been your experience, your soccer experience like, and how did you end up in the chair that you're in today? Yeah. So, uh, first, thanks for having me on. This is going to be, this is going to be a fun one, I'm for sure. And I'm thinking that Jeff Bezos probably went through the same problem you had, uh, so, right, just grew too quick, and you, you're going to eventually have to expand, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we're right there. <laughs> Jeff but, um, Bezos and I, no, nah, I still got some hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, just kind of my quick background experience in the game is I grew up in a town, Clifton Park, New York. It's kind of near Albany and Saratoga area. Um, was a kind of a three-sport athlete growing up, so just kind of did it all soccer, hockey, lacrosse, and just kind of dabbled with golf and some running. So the soccer piece kind of took over a little bit more as I got older. Um, we had some pretty prestigious high school teams, so the level was really high. I moved on to a Division three school around Central New York in SUNY Cortland, so I played there for four years. Um, and I just kind of caught the, the coaching bug as I went through the process of being a player. So after I graduated from Cortland, um, our current coach at the time had left. So a player that I had played with um, took over the program and called me in the summer and said, you want to come back and do this thing? So I just graduated and said, you know, let's kind of get it going. And I coached there for four years, or sorry, for eight years, and um, had some unbelievable experiences at SUNY Cortland. Mm -hmm. Moved on to a, a quick stint at Virginia Wesleyan University um, down south, and then moved to Tufts University. And kind of here I am at SUNY Delhi, so mm -hmm. it's been a kind of a whirlwind but in a great way soccer's kind of taken over my life and uh, the coaching part of it specifically was something that when I was younger um, I idolized some of the coaches that had coached me so I thought mm -hmm. if you can do this and get paid and you know have some other goals in your life it was something that I always wanted to do. Yeah. So. so this was this is an aspiration of yours you didn't stumble upon it you were kind of intentional about becoming a coach in a way yeah I mean yeah. I think we all you know everyone says it's a really tough industry and you have to stick with it and, and I don't disagree with that but I kind of always had this fascination with leadership mm -hmm. and just kind of that that question the chicken or the egg does it is it inherently given or do you can you earn mm -hmm. it and can you kind of so I've, I've balanced kind of both of those and just worked on I guess in my own life being a better leader while coaching other people mm -hmm. so it definitely mm -hmm. has been something that I've I've chased from a very younger age, and it's funny, when I graduated college, I had um, notices in the mail for an overdue book, and I didn't know <laughs> what book it was, because I wasn't taking out many books, but um, <laughs> when, I was a, when I was a sophomore in college, I took out a So You Want to Be a Coach type book, and mm. two years after I graduated, they were still notifying me that I hadn't returned it, so, so yeah. <laughs> It's probably you return the book and you owe them like $150 for a $20 book. You know? <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I still I still have books from the library at, at University of Mount Union that I 
I am like sheepishly avoiding to send back because I'm afraid what the bill's gonna be, right? Like it's been <laughs> thirty some odd years at ten cents a day, you know, it's, it's crazy. Um, hey, so so you were at you were at Cortland. We talked about this a little bit. You were at Cortland with Coach Axtill as a player. You were both playing at the same time, and then you joined his coaching staff. Did I, is that the sequence? Okay. It, and I'm curious, like how, there's a couple de- year difference in, I guess, age, but like how, how big of a D, how big, how important was Coach Axel and what he's done at Cortland been for you as a development of a, in the development of your coaching style? It's a great question. Um, I only do. Well, great I think he's a, yeah. I uh, I think as a player, you know, him being a goalkeeper and me being kind of a midfielder winger, you kind of always had that balance of he was very demanding. Right? Like mm-hmm. the top goalkeepers will always be very demanding. Mm-hmm. So I think his standards were really high um, in maintaining to keep balls out of his net. So I think that's mm-hmm. what I learned the most from Steve was just the standards that he had and kind of the discipline and um, the constant wanting to win was something I took from Steve. And then I think it was also twofold because we took over the program and at the time, I, there's just no way. I don't think there was a younger staff in the nation or maybe in the history of Division Three soccer. We had a 25-year-old, a 24-year-old, a 23-year-old, and I was 22, I think. So mm-hmm. there wasn't a lot of experience in knowing what we were doing, but um, I just think there was such a high level of passion to, to use the program that had given us so much to make it the way that we wanted. So, um, you know, Steve and I have a great relationship. We talk all the time and um, we're still learning from each other. But I would say those were some of the, the pieces that Steve gave, not only me, but definitely to the players throughout those years that I was there. Yeah. I mean, do you see do you see now where you're at, um, at Dell High? Um, like some of those same things that you're going to do in – as you shape your program absolutely i don't think you you know if right something's not broke you don't need to fix it and i think Mm -hmm. those have become a part of my coaching style and i think those pieces to coaching that have worked i'm not straying away from so Mm -hmm. um so yeah absolutely i think there are blueprints and fingerprints all over our program now that started years and years back that we just continue to add to and um Mm -hmm. Like I said, if it's a championship level type team, you know that was at Cortland the years that we were there, and it works. I'm gonna I'm gonna think about that all the time and making my yeah. decisions with my current team. Yeah, I was I'm really impressed by the discipline aspect of it, right? Because I think the and I'll we'll talk about this too. Just the difference between a private school and a public school, and and you know the discipline piece I think comes in a, a lot more on the Publics, not as a bad way, like the public side, public school, then there's a, at a private. But um, I, I am curious as a former player, and you've been going through, like, have, have you noticed that players have gotten better over those years or better, smarter, more technical, any of that? Um, that's really tough to tell. I, I have to be honest, right? I think. You're kind of nostalgic to the time that you played. I think everyone would want to say that their years are the best years. Oh, that totally. you know, it's it's only totally getting the best. Yeah. getting worse. But I, I can tell you <laughs> that showing up and recruiting, you know, you watch some of the players and just their athleticism and mm-hmm. skill, and you just you are somewhat of in awe of the players, obviously that you're after, and then some of the ones that you maybe you won't have a chance at. So um, I think it's a that's tough to tell. But you know, in your mind, I'm still sprinting down the wing and can do exactly what they're doing. But um, but I don't know. I really, that's a, that's yeah, a really tough yeah. one. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, since, you know, I graduated in what, 1990. And since then the game has just gone downhill as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, you know, I just, it is what it is. Um, so, all right. You've been since June, 2021, you have a full season under your belt and this is right. I mean, would you say this is like the first year like your recruiting start to finish for this count it was actually Dude, last year yeah last, last year's year a full last year. year yeah yeah okay yeah. um so uh, 
Well, and I mentioned the culture aspect and discipline. Like, is this a work in progress still for you of sort of defining and building out the program that you want to? And, and you know, how long before you think it is your program? So not, I don't want to say in a bad way, again, sort of like the what was what was left behind when the previous coach is there still stuff that you're working through and yeah um it's a very it was a unique scenario that i came into so when i took over the program in june of 21 it was those years after covid mm -hmm. so um you know the the time period between when i took over and the current or the previous coach was leaving was you know a bunch of a bunch of months kind of stacked up on top of each other. Mm -hmm. So there was a time period in between in the fall of 2020 into 21 that there wasn't anyone in charge. The administration mm -hmm. did an unbelievable job to keep the program recruiting and building, but we also were transitioning to Division Three at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was like we were climbing levels um, and you know, you're know you losing, not players within the program, but you're losing people at college in general. They're unsure if they're coming back or not. So mm -hmm. when I took over in June of 21, the roster size was probably not at the capacity that we needed to go and win a championship. Um, so our women's coach at the time, you know, kept it together while she kept her team together. And then when I took over in June, um, the guys that were there, you know, I had thought maybe were connected to the old coach, right? I thought, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they had the allegiance and I would have to start something that, you know, was going to take some more time. But essentially, I kind of took over a program that had not had much college soccer experience. So, you know, those guys became my guys overnight, and we only had probably four players that played in a college soccer game before mm -hmm. on the roster, and none of them had played in the Division Three game. Wow. So, um, so that first game of the year, you know, you're kind of looking at a roster on the opposite side of returning seniors, right? I'm sure mm -hmm. coaches struggled to find spaces for those returning fifth mm -hmm. years and seniors. We were on the opposite end. We were looking to to build that roster to compete, mm -hmm. and and that group, uh, you know, I'll be honest, Paul. It was they did everything that was asked of them, mm -hmm. and we lost ten games by one goal, a lot of one nothings, and a lot of frustration. But they completely bought into what I was I was telling them to do, and it gave us a chance. And we just missed playoffs, but um, yeah, it was it was a pretty special year for for that group to compete. And that was with. your your first season, right? So that was the three and. Oh, yeah, whatever the record was then. Okay, that's yeah. good to know the context to that, right? Because I, it's I did notice the quantity of one nothing goals, and to me, one nothing goals are like just define how close you are. If you got blown out three four, like that to me says you're not close. But you know, sometimes the soccer gods are not kind, right? And as you probably well know, and and so you see a bunch of one nothing goals and games, and you're like there's something more to this team than what the record shows, right? So Yeah, and that team, you know, specifically, I think, was just missing a couple of goal scorers, but probably what everyone would tell you is how, you know, goals are so important. And, and hard. So one goal game, yeah. So we had a lot of walk-on players that were just getting accustomed to college soccer and freshmen that, you know, were returning or being recruited for their first mm -hmm. year ever. And it was like we jumped levels up, mm -hmm. um, without experience and um, they were learning on the fly. So yeah. we were close, we were really close, but in the end, it, we just fell short. Right, right, right. And then, but clearly, right, like I said, how close you were because then last year you went 10, seven and two, you made the final, right, of the, of the North Atlantic, North, yeah, North Atlantic Conference and then only lost by one goal game, right? That tells me, again, how close that was. Um, so that is quite the turn of events, right? Like I said, you go from three wins to 10 wins and you make the tournament final. That's a, that's a big swing. And not to mention you made coach of the year or whatever the honor is, right? Like that's, um, so that, that, that to me says something about you as well, right? Like you, there was you knew that you had enough you just needed a couple more pieces right so um okay sorry i just went off onto a different um let so this is totally random but what are the type of players that you recruit what are the where where from where are they lo mostly local kids are you expanding your sort of recruiting area yeah 
Um, I I would say, you know, we base it off of New York State just because of the in-state pricing. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, think you're kind of, yeah. yeah, so you're kind of looking at them first. Uh, we, just with my experience in the New York State system and just my kind of knowledge of the area, I think... Um, we look more towards New York City, Long Island, Westchester mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. uh, just there's a lot of players on our current team that have played there and that have connections. So you know, I think it's a it's a really high level of play coming out of the high school system. Mm -hmm. And um, but we are expanding. You know, we'll we'll have Albany and Syracuse. And as you kind of hope to build a program, you start to look at all areas of New York State. So mm -hmm. and then outside as well. You know, you never know. But we do fairly well with some international students. And um, so I would say New York's New York State system probably closer to that New York City area just because it's only a three hour three and a half hour yeah. drive and and we have kind of that that background with with those players that are currently on our team. Um, you said international players. Do you have do you, do you do you look for the international players or is that something that just sort of lands on your lap? Both actually, you know, I'll I'll flip over every rock and try and find the best best players and yeah. but um but yeah we have a couple of international players that have family in the states so they've kind of moved stateside and then oh. made the transition to college so some of that worked on on our end but some of the other ones were they were looking at schools while they were transitioning into America. I um, I actually just pulled up a mat. You're actually pretty close to New Jersey too, right? I mean, you're relatively close. Yep, and they've just okay. um, so SUNY's just added uh, free. Sorry, the transition or the excuse me, the financial match for <laughs> for other states. So we're expanding into Massachusetts and New Jersey, so they can get the in-state pricing that um, yeah. the SUNY system's offering. Yeah. So it's kind of exciting to, to get out and see more players, right? When you show up to a field or you look at a schedule of who's playing, you kind of start at, with New York schools. And I think yeah. now with, with the matching program, you start looking more at Jersey and, and yeah. the other Massachusetts ones. Yeah. I, I always look, the, the reality is, and, and, and you look at all the great programs in the area, right? I mean, there's tons of Division threes, but like the quality of players in this tri-state area is still one of the best areas for just soccer in general, right? You're still, there's, it's not only great quality players, but there's plenty of diamonds in the rough and all those types of players that, man, if I could bring them on board and get them the right coach, like, you, it's, it's a litany of kids. And I think a lot of kids are interested in playing collegiately. I just think, um, I just think I sometimes wonder if their brains are on straight, you know what I mean? Um, which leads me to the next one. Do you, do you, in your recruiting world, do you experience any like D one or bust? Like, oh, we're not, not interested in you because I'm going to be the starter at Duke. <laughs> like, good luck. <laughs> yeah, I think we all do, right? I think every coach wants to reach a little bit higher than what their current program would maybe say that they could get in a way. So I think everyone's reaching for those levels higher. But I think the reality is that when they don't get those letters in the mail or emails from the head coach in the spring of their senior year, they get you know a little frantic towards yeah. what is the next move for them. So yeah, um, so yeah we'll, we'll stay on, on all types of players that are looking at all schools. And I, I never shy away. So I'll, I'll reach out to, to even the ones that you know, maybe initially you don't think are, are ever coming. And later in, in the year, maybe you get a phone call. So yeah. um, that's just the way I think I look at it. Are you are you seeing any any players coming to you that are Division One and are like for whatever reason that it didn't work out or they just want to be closer to home? Are are you seeing any of that like portal activity? Yeah, I think our program's too new right now. To uh -huh. I think we're right on the cusp of hopefully in year three or four having some of those conversations. Yeah. I still think, like you said, there's so many players that. Um, can compete at this level and have an impact. So I think those players right now um, are helping us reach mm -hmm. the goals that we want to reach. But yeah. in the future, I would our, the hope is that the program does expand and continues uh -huh. to push for a national yeah. tournament bid. And um, then you start looking more at those players. But uh, yeah. not as many right now. But isn't, yeah. isn't that the goal, right? You start yeah, having yeah. conversations yeah. And, and then you feel good about it.
Yeah, yeah. Well, I think also the portal activity ends up being like these division kids who went division one, and for whatever reason it doesn't work out. And then they decide, hey, I, I want to play, but now they have this idea. Well, if I can't play D1, I want to play at a reputable, high-level, you know, known school. So they're looking at the top 20 in the country, right? Like, I think that's a very natural, that's a net, net natural progression, right? Whether it's real or not is a different story, but I do think you, you end up... Um, I do think, like I said, once you establish yourself a little bit more and... You know, you do I make think, the NCAA's. I think that's that is a critical that's a critical part of it. Did you make the tournament? Yes or no? Yeah. That's, yeah, that covers it. So for a lot of guys. And I can completely understand the Division One outlook from a high school student, right? They yeah. they want to reach the highest level that they can go. I was once that player myself, and you know, it's, I think it's the education piece at the Division Three level of what does that game look like. And up until my yeah. senior year, I'd never gone to a Division Three yeah. game. So, um, you know, that's kind of some advice I'd give to the youth players is go watch college soccer games when you're younger. And just, yeah. you know, there's probably schools around your area that you could go to because if you ask some of the high school seniors that maybe even have committed, have you been to a college game before or watch one online, a lot of them might not even say yes. Yeah. So, um, so there are levels to the game, but the highest level of Division three can completely compete with Division one levels across oh, this totally country. Agree. And, totally and, agree. And... Um, and I just think, you know, sometimes that gets overlooked in the process because of a tagline, but it might not be the best fit for that individual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I also think, like, right or, again, right or wrong, Division One is defined by five, ten programs. It's not, it's not, rea like, there are some pretty bad Division One programs, right? Like, that don't have facilities, like, all that... All those things still apply, right? It's not not everybody's UNC or <clears throat> Maryland and has a stadium and the locker room and all. Like not not all of that. Is not that's not necessarily the case. And I would argue that there's Division One, Division Three schools that have better facilities than some of the Division One programs. But um, I can go down. This this is a big rabbit hole for me. So, um, but playing wise, up until I OD'd on the 200 some odd games that first year, I would have said, oh yeah, the, the quality level is much lower at the division three. I'm, I'm of the conviction that it's a more of a size athleticism thing than it is a soccer thing because I've watched division one games that are pretty gosh darn awful, right? And they're just pretty sad. You know, if this is representative of Division One soccer, man, I'll take a Division Three soccer game any any day of the week because I just think it's there's a little there the, the quality is there and I see it more maybe because my focus right it's more expansive a lot more programs are a lot better than what people give them credit for so um, all right so I do have to ask uh, I'm so going off like I have this thing right it's got all these cool questions and I'm like I'm so I, I haven't gotten for, through the first like 10 because I keep going off on tangents so I apologize for that if you're expecting structure I failed um, hey is there like do you do you and maybe New York's different because the SUNY system is totally and uh, I mean, it's a def definite, I'll just say it's a lot more unique because it's more prevalent and it's bigger and you get more more funding, all that kind of stuff. Like, do you, do you see a difference between a public school like Delhi versus the privates? Do you, do you see any difference there? Uh, and you, especially, I guess, when you're recruiting players, right? I mean, I mean, I guess that would be where it would matter. Yeah, um, in a player standpoint, or just personal, or no, just yeah, whatever. You're you, yeah. Yeah, I think it. I honestly think you kind of get you get them all rounded. I would say. I mean, it's it, for me, it's based off of their situation. So um, you know, you don't know everyone's personal situation or where their parents went to college or you know what they're looking for. And sometimes you have state school. Um, players that can afford private school level type education you and the opposite and I just think you know for us when we recruit we're looking for that kind of triangulated three-pronged 
of what they want. So it has to be for us the academic piece. It has to fit their major. And for me, I don't I don't love recruiting players that have really no idea of even a direction, right? Because I yeah. think if you get here and you don't have even one, two, three options of something you might be interested in, you're probably going to be in trouble. Um, I knew that was the case for me as a player. I kind of had to X schools out because my parents weren't um, thrilled with me just being a soccer player. So I think that's important. I think the second piece to that is obviously the school. You know, you can yeah. kind of make that one in one A is the school's got to fit you, right? The, yeah. the location from home, the, the dorms, the, everything has to feel comfortable for you and fit because if soccer doesn't work out or, if, you know, God forbid you have an injury that prevents you from playing, are you going to be happy? And then, you know, obviously that last piece is, is the is a financial piece and you yeah. can kind of wrap soccer into that as well but um so it's got a match for me all three and uh and i look for that i really do i truly look for that in in players because i want mm-hmm. the guys that we pick right if it if essentially get to pick them we want all of those pieces to match and for them to come in and really be excited about not only soccer but school and and what's next for them after because if they're not excited for what's after and it ends i always say the the saddest thing is to watch kind of a student athlete go back and not have a plan so Mm -hmm. we push out plans and players and you know fortunately for us we have a couple of of guys already on full-time jobs right now that are heading into the real world next year and guys going into this yeah yeah, some big time some jobs so it's Mm -hmm. it's exciting to see the program work for them in the way that you know we want it to but um but i just don't think it works if you're going to be a soccer player and then just leave so Mm -hmm. um, anyone that comes through our doors on our team is is a person first and then the soccer piece is obviously like I said one and one a but uh, I just I don't do well with having competitors you know on the field and then kind of the the mediocre floaters yeah, floaters. Floaters. yeah so yeah. and and I I've kind of seen that in in life and decisions of friends and everything so that you know high achievers love high achievers and the the mediocre guys that like sitting around all day they like the mediocre guys and that's okay but yeah. it's just it probably never matches if you're a mediocre Mindset with a high achieving mindset because you're yeah, always yeah, going to yeah. feel uncomfortable both yeah, ways. So, it's both ways, right? Like it's uncomfortable to deal with if you're a high achiever. I see this in the corporate world, right? Like it's just, it's if you're a high achiever and, and and you're like looking to hey next 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 and you have somebody who's dragging their knuckles like that doesn't that doesn't feel good either. And if you're dragging your knuckles and you got somebody barking at you, come on, come on, come on, come on. That's like, uh, this, this, this is not what I signed up for, right? This is the, the personality clash. Um, yeah, it's just interesting to me, right? Like it's a, a, a different dynamic and, and I'm always curious about that. And like I said, I think the Sunnis are a lot different than other public schools, especially in you know, in the Northeast, just because there's the quantity of, there's a, such a quantity of schools to, 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 that you can go to, right? Like, seriously, as a player, if you're a soccer player, you can now, you can pick schools based on so many different qualities that you have access to that I never had access to, information that I you know, down to, hey, do I really want to play in this style, right? Like, I can actually watch games and see, and it's not just the coach talking. I can actually watch how they play. Like, so I think I think that public-private thing might sort of be balancing out because there's so much more information that kids can 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 grasp onto and to make their decisions. So. Um, Hey, so you're you're building your program. Are there any non-negotiables for the players on the team to be a part of the program? Hmm. Um. They have to do a triathlon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Um. You know, I think there we have so many. So I don't have a lot of rules, I think, as a coach. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of have one rule with our players, which is um, do the right thing. You all kind of know what that is. And if you have to think about it, don't do it. And mm-hmm. I think those kind of raise the level of standards within the team. Mm-hmm. So um, as we talk about what those standards are, it's just kind of they mature at a pretty intense rate. And I think myself as a coach, is that's what I, I think what wins is mm-hmm. when you look at the field of a championship team's oftentimes more oftentimes than not are probably going to be older players right if you have an 18 year old or a 22 year old 
at some point, if you have a field full of 22-year-olds, you might have a better chance, um, I believe, at our level to win with experience, maturity, athleticism. So, um, so that's kind of what we try and do is we, there isn't, you know, I'm sure there's non-negotiables that you know, all coaches probably abide by, myself included, be on time, you know, look the part. We, we talk a lot about, you know, how we handle ourselves and wear the crest throughout the entire year, you know, even when you're back home or off campus. And so um, just for me, it's trying to get them to a level of maturity and physically so that when you are older, right, um, you're more mature than the other person that's putting in the same resume at the job that you're looking at too. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. so yeah, it's a, it's a tough question, I would say, like if one pinpoint something, but mm-hmm. I just think the non-negotiables are carried probably more by your older players that have you know, been underneath yeah. you as a coach yeah. for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, 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 I, I get there. You got. You're probably dealing with a lot, right? Like you're relatively new, shaping the program. Just the nature of Delhi coming to Division Three. All, all those different things. I mean, do you, do you still? Are your expectations for what you want to accomplish in next year, knowing? Sort of where you're coming from, are they tempered at all by any of that? Or are you just sort of like we're going gangbusters? We we won ten this year. We want thirteen next year, and we want to make the tournament. Yeah, I think it's it kind of goes without saying. I mean, the players mm-hmm. it, we talk about right that one percent every day, and we just want to get better. And I I have no expectations for this season that we just had. You know, I think the group mm-hmm. did. They might have blown my expectations out of the water. I think there's the only thing that we could do is just work as hard as we can to give ourselves that best chance and next year is kind of the same right everyone thinks when you lose in the championship game if you win one more game next year it's a success and and I think that's always going to be the goal right I don't think we say we want to just be be runners up again so I think getting back to that game would be a goal of this current group Mm -hmm. but um but I just I know them individually and and I think they're the ones carrying it you know they're the ones that are asking me to turn the, turn the lights on at night or coach, you know, what more can we do? And with obviously with the rules and regulations of the NCAA, there's only so much you can in the spring. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so they're pushing out as much as they can as a group. And also I think they carry that along with our school. You know, I think the other athletic programs at our school, our Benz basketball team just won the NAC, was in the NCAA tournament. Our women's team won the NAC this year and was in the NCAA tournament. And we've had other programs that are just right there. So, I think when you start looking around in the gym and you're surrounded by those athletes, there really isn't a let's fade into the group. It's almost like we want to be the team that is at top of campus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and that sort of thing breeds out the best in any program across this country is you're surrounded by those people who are your Mm -hmm. friends. So like I said before, those high achievers, you can't have we are the only team on campus and the rest of the teams don't do as well. I think that as our program in Division Three continues to develop is – something that's really exciting because we were new kids on the block two years ago and now with the success of the programs hopefully the knack and the rest of the league says you know they're mm-hmm. they're one of the contenders yeah yeah yeah. what was there a reason why you went to the knack and not the suniac I, I don't know if that's a, that's a dumb question or not i just thought of that um Specifically, I don't know exactly why i think i've heard the the jokes with coaches that we are kind of the suniac too Right now, uh-huh. like if there was more room for the SUNYAC, we'd be in the SUNYAC, yeah. but we're kind of the SUNYAC twos because we're yeah. state schools that kind of are close to each other. So um, I don't know the exact reason, but I do know yeah. that we look at ourselves as a state school and we actually play yeah. a lot of the state schools. So yeah, yeah. Um, SUNY teams. Yeah. Okay. I, I have more curiosity. I didn't. So tell me, tell me about the the knack i how can from your standpoint i i've spoken in the past to coach penrod at suny canton great guy i have to have him back on to 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 talk to him um and then the only other thing i am aware of is that casanovia is closing its doors so i should have worn casanovia's hat today that i managed to order and um um but yeah so what from your perspective tell me about the north atlantic conference yeah, so <clears throat> we've been adding teams as well in the last year, but essentially we're we're an east and a west. So we have a lot of Maine and Vermont schools on the east, and we're in the west, and we play a lot of the New York schools. Um, and the winner of those two 
programs on each side will play in the divisional championship or divisional. You win your divisional, you go on, you play in the final, and the winner of that goes to the NCAA tournament. So um, I actually love the league. I think you know one thing that we would probably all agree on is that we all have a chance to win the league. You know, I think it's tough, and it was one of the one of the reasons why I thought this job was so enticing was you're not joining a league that you know you're going to have to build against you know five top ten teams in the country. Mm-hmm. You know, and you never know if there's ever an out to get those goals that you want to reach. So I think mm-hmm. the fact that every game is is going to be tight and that in the divisional rounds nobody knows. I think we had four new, yeah, I think there was a new final this year. Um, you know, between us and the and the team that we played. So mm-hmm. I, ju- I just love that. I think, you know, it's just, it makes it fun, and I think it gives the players that sense of we're going to have a chance at this every year. So mm-hmm. um, that's what I like about yeah. it. So, all right, so which field do you play on? Do you play on the turf field or are you on the track? So we're on the turf field. We have a brand-new turf field. That yep. was used this fall, first time ever, and mm-hmm. I'll try and again be unbiased, but I think it's the prettiest uh, facility that I've seen, in, at least in the Northeast and potentially the country. We're kind of up in the Catskill Mountain region range, so um, it is just gorgeous. You you overlook kind of a bunch of of mountains and yeah. you know a great new turf field and you know, with great fans that come out, good atmosphere for our game. So we actually had 11 home games this fall. Wow. I kind of stack some home games to <laughs> hope that the excitement for the team would uh, yeah. would bring players and people out to yeah. the games and and it and hopefully it worked. So we're gonna keep building on it. But yeah, um, yeah when you stand and you look and you just see for miles, um, you know the foliage and yeah. just the beauty of it all. It's it's fantastic. I'm looking at the field, the track field, because on the map it says soccer field too. So I don't know. But I'm looking at the track level, and you can see the mountains in the background, which is really cool. And then the picture of the turf field is from an aerial shot from up top, so I don't see anything. But um, I, I'm just yeah. curious. Boy, that was so that would be random. so the track would kind of be on the lower part of campus. I uh-huh. actually call it in my own mind. I call it Mount Olympus because uh-huh. we're right on top of campus, ah, is where the okay. the athletic hub is, and our uh-huh. our indoor facility. So. When you're up top there, you feel honestly like you're kind of on top of the world. Yeah. Um, oh, so it's it's beautiful. Oh, and I can see because the tennis courts, you're looking down into the into what oh, I think is campus. There's a big building yep. to the right. Ah, okay. So you would be right there as well, actually higher up, I guess. A little bit higher. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. That's so why I'm gonna have to get there somehow, some way in the fall. Does it, um, yeah, so we'll have to, I'll, I'll have to, let me get back on track. <laughs> um, um, but, but just from a recruiting standpoint, and I know we talked a little bit about sort of where you go, but like, do you have any thoughts on showcase tournaments? Like, do you, do you put value in it? Definitely, yeah. I think, you know, the, the idea is that they've, with the levels that they've kind of shown the coaches beforehand that this is the level of play that you're watching on a field. So I think it mm-hmm. does a really good job of filtering that for the coaches. Um, but it's got to fit, right? It has to it has to fit your recruiting style. And um, if it takes us driving to, you know, Virginia or Florida, whatever it is, you know, to see the players and that you think are going to be able to help your program, I think that's big. I think if you kind of just show up sometimes and you're just staring at a field and jotting notes, it might not always work for you and your program. So yeah. um, I put a lot of value into them, but I also put a lot of value into um, you know some of those ID camps. I think camps yeah. are great. I think you give that interaction, personal one v one. And I know a lot of players that in the past that I've coached at those camps have said, you know, I felt really comfortable with just you as a coach and I like playing for you and I looked at your school and it might be a fit. So I think those are, although it's in your summertime period off, it's those are really valuable. And for the players to say, do I like that school that they're at, yeah. number one? And then also if there's other coaches there, what is that school? And mm-hmm. I'm sure when you go to an ID camp, you're there for that school. But if there's other coaches there that might have your major program and financially it works for you, those are really yeah. valuable. Do you- do you have your own ID camp? We're building to have one next year. I just yeah. think with 
kind of the our field was not put in until this fall yeah, yeah, yeah. so like end of the summer and um so i think this just with the the mass amount of what was going on at the school and the time and i'm looking towards next winter next to kind winter. of yeah, yeah. really so put that in of, yeah yeah that makes sense yeah i i think i the reason why i asked that question because it's totally off to off tangent but aside from that like I, I I often think about like what's more valuable a showcase or an ID camp and I think they both have their value but if I had to pick one or versus the other I would say the ID camp is gives at least the opportunity to interact at a level that you would never get at a at a showcase and I think like I said I think there's value that you get out of seeing soccer players in their natural habitat so they go to a showcase they're playing in there with their teams and their current coaches and you might see a lot of personality things that you wouldn't necessarily see when they're on their best behavior but i think the id camps are definitely i think they're probably more important if i were to rank the two but um, and i think what's different about id camps is you you get to see that player kind of where they want to play yeah. with the scenario that they're joining a new team, right? So it's no different than when you join your college soccer team. You're joining all new faces and players. And yeah. I think I look at that and see how do they respond to the, that. Yeah. But also yeah. on their club team, you never know, right? What team are they playing? Are they playing yeah. a team that's you know better than them, not as good? Mm -hmm. why, is, why is he playing right mid when he's a left back? You know, all those yeah. questions that you have at the showcase level. And maybe he just got in a car for 12 hours, didn't feel good, and he's not having a good day. You know, you never know. So yeah, yeah. I think... Usually you get the best out of that player on the day that they come to that ID camp because the reason why they're coming is probably because they're interested in your school. So yeah, yeah. they're excited to, sh to showcase themselves in front of you just like everybody else is, but they're going to give you your best individually as opposed yeah. to the team that you might show up for. You never know kind of what you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. Um, which leads me to something else that I didn't ask that I should have asked earlier. It doesn't lead me there. It's just popped into my head. Um, how how is it that you want? Again, I, I I I just I just think there's probably a lot of work in progress, right? Like you're there's a lot of things that timing wise, you have two years under your belt. I think probably you need a few more cycles just to really solidify what you want to do. But what? Like, how would you want your team to play? Like, if you could tomorrow just be like, this is how we're going to play. This is what I want everybody to buy. This is what I'm recruiting for. Because it, it, right? Like, it's a difference between what you're recruiting for if you're recruiting for, because you need certain players to fill spots versus you're looking for players to fill in your idea of how you want to play. But So I'll leave it there. What, what, how yeah. would you, if somebody's going to ask you, like, how would, do you want to to have your team play and what do what when people watch what they what you want them to be entertained by yeah um i think it was different for us in the last couple of years knowing we probably had to play a more defensive style mm -hmm. to get to where we wanted to get to um i was an attacking player myself so i love the free-flowing you know send all your numbers forward and try and score mm -hmm. goals but i'm also very stern on you know i do think defending is a mindset I think defending is just how much focus you have in that in that one v one and how important it is to you, right? If your strikers and midfielders aren't kind of not defending to the level that you need them to, because their defenders are behind them, and then all of a sudden the ball's in the back of your net, I just I don't I think that's a lazy mentality. So um, so I'm very stern on the defensive piece, but I would say the transition into where I want to play is I want a dominant style of we don't like playing against that team. If you're only going to get 45 minutes, you're going to get 15 minutes to talk about it and go back out there with 45 minutes. If your team's fit enough um, and have the players to dominate, I mean, not let your foot off the gas the whole game. That would be my style. I don't have mm -hmm. a, I want to pass the ball around and keep it. I, I don't have a, we want to kick it long. I just kind of have this, you are players in the moment that read scenarios that we have trained into you. Mm -hmm. And then also, what's your mindset to dominate, you know, just physically mostly, right? How much can you run? How much can you you press and how much can you just be be mature enough to figure out what you have to do in your one-on-one -on -one battle so mm -hmm. that's the style i i want to impose on the players is that mm -hmm. just to compete all the time and, and i don't know maybe it's just me as a person i don't really identify with the the not competings and the the ties and i don't know i i really don't 
I don't know. I've, I have friends that probably don't hang out with me anymore because it's just, let's go again. It's that Michael <laughs> Jordan type. They just, I don't know. I just would play 86 holes of golf, whatever, just to say, I finally got you because it's, <laughs> it's just, yeah. That's so, awesome. That so it's awesome. there. Yeah, it's yeah, in there, yeah. but um, but I that, that's the style for us. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not, I mean, you're not wedded to any particular way into accomplishing that and getting your team forward, in other words. You're just, how do we get the ball forward, and once we get the ball forward, let's ram it, not ram it down their throat, but let's get it to a point where we have them in a chokehold and we're going to get a goal one way or the other. Yeah, I do, because I think in the game you're going to have waves where you're not that, right? I don't think yeah. any team's going to think for 90 minutes the ball is not going to cross the halfway line and we're not going to be in danger, right? With a one-goal game, you know, you even look at some of the games that we had, you know, maybe you don't touch the ball as much as you want, but then you win the game one nothing. Um, yeah. You know, a transition goal or a free kick, a set piece. So, um, so that's what I want, is I want the players focused to not turn off but also stay in to say you don't have to have those waves. You know, yeah. for the majority of the game, you might have one or two, but you don't need to have that if you yeah. are the team that you want to be. Yeah. Hey, let me. Let, I, I just, I just thought of something too, something totally different, uh, unrelated. No, related. But based on what you said, was there a difference between the first year when you were three, blah blah blah, and then this last year when you were ten and you made the 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 finals? Like, was there? Did you notice a? difference in how you played from one year to the next yeah for sure yeah I think just because of the situation that was mm -hmm. kind of handed into was mm -hmm. we did not have the quality going forward that I right. know that we had this year so uh -huh. um, being a little bit stronger in the back allowed us to go forward a lot more and then the players going forward were you know I think we scored 11 goals in 21 and uh -huh. this year we had a lot more than 11 yeah, so yeah, yeah. So that was the difference, I think, was just taking the pressure off our defending from year one to year two yeah, yeah. and giving ourselves chances to score, not just one goal in a game, you know, two, three, four. That was that was helpful. That uh, It's funny that you say that because I actually had a conversation with simple player number three, I think it was, um, the other day, that, um, that you don't realize how important it is to have some – have your final third – to be somewhat effective either scoring goals or holding on to the ball because it obviously gives you an opportunity to score but more importantly I think than the scoring piece strangely enough that scoring should be paramount but it basically relieves your defenders of being under pressure yeah um, because I see too many teams where their final third is just not effective at all and and you can see it it's like no well they're terrible so what's going to happen is that pressure is going to mount pressure is going to mount and they're going to eventually break because no team i think can effectively handle pressure for 90 minutes no defensive unit right at, a, at the youth level right and i think a lot at the collegiate level so um Okay, so two more questions. I'll let you get on with the day. I've been rambling. I apologize. I, I totally, I definitely need that executive assistant. Um, so if you have any recommendations, by all means, um, come be really cheap. Um, hey, um, what what does your recruiting class look like? Good, I, I'd hope, right? I think everyone wants to say that they have the <laughs> yeah. incoming players, but um, to help them get to the next phase of where they want the program to go. But, um, you know, just for us, I, I'll be honest, I just think they're really good people, um, mm -hmm. you know, who are very good at soccer. So I, for us, we're just excited about them adding value to our team. Mm -hmm. But um, then we just hope on the field they can, they can fill some spots that, you know, we've wanted to have more depth at or or score more goals or keep more balls out of our net. So mm -hmm. for us, I just, I'm really thrilled to have them as people. And I know our guys have done a great job of connecting them. And that's one thing I, mm -hmm. I preach to our players is that when they commit, you know, I want them instantly to shed the colors of the club and yeah, shed the colors yeah. of the high school and put them behind you and put this logo on. And yeah. so once they commit and they're deposited and everything's paid, they're, they're one of us. So we've got a bunch right now that are already have been up for visits and mm -hmm. texting guys and on social media and, so that I know that comfortability matters because the goal of a preseason is not to get everyone to 
you know, shake hands and say hello for the first time. I yeah. think the goal of the preseason is to talk about how are we going to go beat teams. And for us, we yeah. play SUNY Cortland and SUNY Oneonta in our first week of preseason. Right, that, so, that, oh my gosh, I saw I, think, th- I saw that you had it in the last one too, and I'm like, 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 my, why, you might as well just jump right into the fire, right at the get no slow roll. This let's let's jump right in. And I think um, it helps. I think yeah. it, you know, it helps you grow up very quickly into your first game. So within two and a half weeks, you know, you're playing a match that is going to go on a score sheet forever. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So is it done? Are you done with the recruiting for this class? or We're still at, adding a few additions to it. Yeah, mm-hmm. just shaping up kind of some of the spots that we feel could use depth based yeah. off the current players. Yeah. And in my head, I, I don't know, maybe it's just the pessimist in me. In my head, I just think they're all going to somehow call me in the summer and say they wow. hurt them. You know, something happened. Yeah. And so in my mind, I want, I always want to just be prepared without overfilling a roster. I just want to yeah. make sure that we're sold on them as people to be able to yeah. grow into those spots um, that can help us if, uh, if that does happen. Because those phone calls are, you know, every coach will know. You get a phone call yeah. in the summer randomly on that Tuesday afternoon, and you're just, yeah. your heart sinks if something went yeah, wrong. Yeah, but something sometimes went wrong. They, they call just to say hi, and you're, you know, is everything okay? But for the most part, yeah, <laughs> for the most yeah. part, it's good stuff. Hey, what's the, um, how, how many, how many in your recruiting class, if I may ask? Um, I think it, it, de- it just depends to keep, I want to keep a roster between 26 and 30. Uh-huh. So, um, so I think recruiting would depend on, yeah, yeah. on that number. I don't want to go yeah. over that number. I think when you get past the thirties, it's, it's a lot to manage. And when, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, when you're little, doing that. A little dicey. Yeah, it ends up being a little dicey, right? Yeah. Um, do you, are they, uh, clearly not the last questions, by the way. Um, do, like, did you have a lot of gr- folks, you mentioned earlier, I wasn't sure, like, are a lot of kids graduating for you from this past season? Because you were on the younger side for, right, because you're starting a Division three program, what have you. It, are they still, is it still young? It is very young, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. this group... um, Bonus, bonus. Yeah, you hope, right? You hope that they continue to grow into it. Mm. But um, but yeah, we lost four seniors. So so we lose four, but a lot of the players came back. You know, we have a great spring roster. The first year, 21 spring roster was was short. I think we played a backup goalkeeper in our spring game. You know, (laughs) it's just one of those. Everyone deals with numbers in their spring game, but ours... Unfortunately, that year was really small. So this year, we've actually started training last week. We've got a good group, and we've got a great numbers group, mm-hmm. so we can play and we can compete and, and do all that. But um, but this year's team was just, I mean, I, to speak to the freshmen and what they did when they came in, it, it definitely oh, shocked me. Huge. And I do I do think the the SUNY Cortland and SUNY Oneonta game really helped to mm-hmm. take those emotions out of what is it like to play in a game. And, you know, you're a starter and... And scrimmage one, so I think that really helped. But um, but this group was just tremendously resilient, and um, our sophomores that returned, that were freshmen, right, that were a three-win team, they bought in, and then the seniors that graduated, you know, they led the charge in building the standards for the incoming players. So when they came in, like I said, those freshmen that were freshmen this year felt comfortable, they felt a part of it, they were ready to play, and then you know they had great seasons. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, one last one. This is always the question on the new coach that I speak with that I always forget. What do you think the What do you think a high school player lacks when they come into the college setting, just soccer wise? And because they obviously have to deal with a lot, like this, a lot of stuff. But from a soccer perspective, what do you think they need to learn and learn quickly when they show up to camp? for the first time yeah I think the easiest one would just say physicality but for me it's just kind of it's kind of knowing that the the goal and objective is to win right Mm -hmm. and I think sometimes within the game keeping the ball might look like a win for some players coming out of the high school level level but um but I would say showing them ways that the objective of college soccer is to win games right if we win three games again this year we're not doing anything that we want to do so you know the development piece will happen throughout other parts of the year but in the fall when you come in the goal is to win and 
if that's winning clean and pretty or winning dirty, it's just the objective is to win. So I would say that's something that I do think they lack mentally is that um, that competitiveness to understand that winning definitely does matter. It's not everything, but it definitely does matter when you first show up to campus. Um, and that's why in preseason sometimes freshmen fade to the back because they think yeah. the senior that's been here for three years, he's 21, you know, he's the center mid, and I, I'm just as good, but he's probably, you know, it's probably his yeah. spot. I think that is the mistake that some of the players make is yeah. it's just as much as your chance to go steal that spot as it is theirs to take it over. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the mentality that sometimes they do lack coming in. You have to push that out of them, coach that out of them, tell them how important and, and special they can be when if they came in with that mentality, um, they might have more instant success. That's a great point because, you know, that's why I'm a big fan, believe it or not, of high school soccer and why I have, not a disdain, that's a, too strong a word, but why I have troubles with the way club soccer is today is that there's no, there's no emotional attachment at the club level, right? Like, you're not playing because you're so emotionally tied into your club. It's just, and that's why I say it ends up being a little bit vanilla-ish for me, even watching, right? It's a little too formulaic. Everybody does the same thing. There's not, whereas you look at, you watch a high school game, and there's some, there's an emotional connection, whether it's to the school or the town, whatever that is, that winning matters, right? Whereas at the club level, you're told so many times, well, the results don't matter. Like all that, it sort of dumbs it down. And then you jump back into, you know, into college, you go division three, two or one, doesn't matter. Man, it is all about winning, you know? And so, so that's why, anyhow, I just rambled. Yeah. That's a, that was no. a great observation. But I agree with you on that. I think it, it connects it connects a lot of people. That's what I think what yeah. sports does, right? And I know yeah. even at the high school level, if you play for your high school team, your teachers might be chaperones at that game, yeah. right? Yeah. So they might talk to you in, in the school or you know somebody else in your gym mm -hmm. class, hey, saw you got the game-winning goal, whatever it is. Yeah. I think it connects you to the community. And also that, that pride in the community, it's, it's, it does leave those lasting yeah. memories, right? I mean, yeah. you can take off the colors and graduate and move on, but if you've done it the right way and you've had teams that have had success or, you know, you've done great things for your community, it never goes away. And no. I think that's what's so cool about not just college soccer, but soccer in general, right? When the club game goes away, it is tough to say, unless you win you know, a state championship or something, that the regular club game will be remembered. Yeah. And that's why I think when I go to these games, and I'm actually the, co the intramural coordinator for, um, for SUNY Delahaye here, and we have T-shirts, and those you know, individual that come, they want to play for a T-shirt. And I think yeah. at the club level, I would... I would wish more that they would play for something because I do think those players that come and just come to showcases sometimes don't give you their best. And I know it sounds like, you know, if you threw out a t-shirt, would they play harder? I don't know. You just might. If it's a championship or you're, you know, you call it a championship, whatever it is, you're probably going to work just a little bit harder. You might get the best out of that, that player that, and it makes it fun. I'll, I'll show, you yeah, know, I might show yeah. up to a field that is playing a championship game rather than just game two. But yeah. that's just me. That's my own competitive side coming out. I've, yeah. I've griped a little bit about those, and I understand that it can't be for everything all the time. But in my own head, I would I would always want it to be no, for something. It is it is true, right? Like it's there is the the showcase is just that. Like the game ends, and there's no there's no pissed off people. Like it's just like oh well, you know, like oh it's just a showcase, right? Like. The excuse making, or I don't want to say it's excuse making, but you, you give yourself mental latitude when you you go to a game like that, and that it's not for something. Even the league games aren't really for much, right? Like it doesn't. Whereas again, a school at the community, I tell I tell the simple players this all the time. I'm like, 50 years from now, the games you remember mattered. So it's a high school game. It's you're gonna play in college, whatever. Those matter. You will never, for the most part, again, like oh, if you win the state cup and all that stuff, you're not gonna remember those moments, and you won't remember the details of those games, right? Like it's just because there's, you don't have that emotional connection to, to it like you do again at the high school level, or if you, if you, you, you have the fortune of playing in college. But that's a whole other. We, I, I mean, let's start recording again, and we'll do another <laughs> hour just on that because it does. It, it matters. Like, that's what you see. 
players can only play to a, I'm convinced, only play to a 90% level when they're just playing, right? And there's nothing at stake. To get that next 10% and then above um, and beyond that, it requires just an emotional commitment to whatever they're doing. And, uh, and you don't necessarily see that at club soccer by and large. In some instances you do, but, but by and large, I don't think that's the case. So who's interviewing who here? Like you're, yeah. I'm just like getting totally into this. But anyhow, coach, thank you very much. This was a blast. Really did, really do. This was great. Um, uh, appreciate you taking the time. Love talking soccer with you and, and your program. And we'll definitely have to make a point to get up there in the in the fall at some point and catch a game. And, um, cheer you guys on from your new field. Yeah. Absolutely. So right. this was fun, Paul. I really do appreciate it. You know, it's, yeah. we talked before a little bit about like how much further it's going with with players and coaches and you know everything. It's just it's cool to keep it keep it people connected. And uh, like I drive 30 minutes every day to to go you know to work, and I listen to a, a podcast here or there and just get different Thanks. insight on on other coaches. So um, it always helps. And and yeah, we got to set up another one. You got to come. Up to Mount Olympus and, oh, and yeah, watch a game. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, I'll I'll come out with my executive assistant and all the fancy <laughs> cameras that I don't have because I'm expanding. But I will have by then. But yeah, we'll definitely, we we'll definitely um, we'll look to do that. Um, but thanks again. And uh, yeah, we'll connect before the season. We'll definitely do something else. All right. Absolutely. Thanks, If you like this show, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. You can also find me on anti-social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks. This is a message from my chief marketing officer. I think this keeps him happy.